Jeff George was one of the most talented rocket arm quarterbacks to ever play the position. His one defect, uh, he was kind of an asshole. He butted heads with coaches and management, never endeared himself to teammates, was hated by two different teams, both in his hometown, hated by another team, insulted his own fans, taunted opposing fans, got mooned by his ex-fans, called his own plays, and cussed out his coach on the sideline. He was so hated, fans heckled his grandmother at games. He also attempted comebacks three different times. And maybe he wasn't all that bad of a guy? Let's find out. The most hated QB in NFL history is coming up right after this. This video is sponsored by Rocket Money. Quick, what's your biggest fear? You probably said heights or spiders, but for me, it's looking at my bank account. That's why now I use Rocket Money, an all-in-one finance platform that helps both you and me save more and spend less. With Rocket Money, you can manage subscriptions, lower bills, monitor your credit score, and build your savings all in one place. Personally, I love that it can find and cancel unwanted subscriptions. That alone is worth it. I hate canceling things, and they try to hide from you and make it scary. Well, no more. Rocket Money does all the hard work. I also love how I can set budgets and stick to them. I get notifications if I overspend. It's like my own voice of reason that tells me not to buy that new car I don't need or that tells me not to go into that dark basement. Also, Rocket Money gives me a clear picture of my net worth, my cash, debts, investments, retirement savings, assets, you name it. So after this video, head on over to rocketmoney.com forward slash five points vids to try it out today and unlock more features with premium. Again, that's rocketmoney.com forward slash five points vids from the link below to start getting your finances and your life in order today. Jeff George's talent was apparent from the get go. He was named the 1985 USA Today National Player of the Year while representing Warren Central High School in Indianapolis. Believe it or not, he was actually teammates with Jason Whitlock, who still hasn't figured out the concept of targeted advertising. Even with Stephen A. Smith's arch nemesis roaming the locker room, George tossed an astounding 45 touchdowns as a senior, locking up the 1985 Dial Award as the National Scholar Athlete of the Year. George wanted to start in college, he wanted to start right away. That meant turning down offers from UCLA and a powerhouse institution at Miami if it meant going somewhere he could be QB1 in year one. It was also important to George that he be near his family. So George committed to Purdue, where the quarterback experience mixed results in seven starts, and the Boilermakers finished the year with a three and eight record. With the appointment of new head coach, run first Fred Akers, George initially declared his intention to transfer to Miami, but ultimately enrolled at Illinois. His decision to leave Purdue resulted in the sale of anti-George t-shirts at the university bookstore, and some individuals in Indiana still still hate him for it. They'd get another chance to hate him again. When he traveled back to Purdue for a game his senior year at Illinois, the Boilermakers greeted him with ass. No, not the he got game Jesus Shuttlesworth kind. 15 different Purdue fraternity brothers mooned George upon his arrival, but the 30 cheek salute only inspired the Illini to defeat them in a 14 2 Iowincian classic. The Indianapolis Colts, thinking that hometown boy George would be the right fit, selected him number one overall in the 1990 NFL draft. But that came at a price. The Colts traded valuable assets to move up to get him, including Pro Bowl offensive tackle Chris Hinton, promising wide receiver Andre Risen, and two draft picks. George secured the largest rookie contract in NFL history at the time, getting paid $15 million over six years with a $3.5 million signing bonus. Despite possessing a howitzer for an arm, the first thing Indy fans noticed, he was a giant asshole. By 1993, he had lost 35 of 49 starts with 41 TD passes and 46 INTs, engaging in conflicts with the front office, coach Ted Marchabroda, teammates, and even the fans. A seven week preseason holdout in 1993 and a rocky relationship with Marchabroda ensued. The holdout severely damaged his reputation in Indianapolis. Radio and TV stations camped out outside of his house. Local liquor stores advertised Jeff George Wine, wine with an H, in their windows. Ted Marchabroda was critical of his starting quarterback, insisting that he dropped back too nonchalantly and relied too much on his arm. That's been it, Marchabroda said to ESPN in 2001. Outside
side of the arm, I don't know what he really believes. It's like he doesn't accept help beyond what his arm is able to do for him. He also never clicked with his teammates, whereas most quarterbacks try to buddy up with their offensive linemen, buying them anything from beers to watches for protecting their blind side. That just wasn't George's style. One Colt teammate said the guy was sort of poison, just negative. He's just a baby. He thought he was hot shit. Nobody liked him. And he was surrounded by sycophants, family and friends, telling him how great he was. George preferred the company of his family. His very large family, Colts coaches, including Marcia Broda, believe that he spent too much time with his family, choosing to eat dinner with them every Saturday night instead of with his teammates, creating a void in leadership. It didn't help that fans heckled Jeff George's grandmother at games. Despite his OC actually liking him and saying he was a delight to coach, by 1994, the decision was clear. George had to go. The disgruntled quarterback was traded to Atlanta in March. Although the Colts may have wished the Falcons had taken George in the first place, the departure did yield a positive outcome. A 1996 first round pick used to select Syracuse wide receiver Marvin Harrison. To be fair, the Colts failed George. Despite the blame often placed on the quarterback, the team's 1-15 record in 1991 and 146 sacks in four seasons suggest a more complex situation than just an innovation efficient signal caller. One of George's only advocates, former strength and conditioning coach Tom Zupanchik, sang praises about the QB's dedication in the weight room and said that George probably could have benefited from a PR representative. You know, the thing that most players have now. After parting ways with the Colts, George's career took various turns, often frustrating fans and coaches with amazing talent and seemingly immature behavior. When Jeff George arrived with the Falcons, left guard Lincoln Kennedy expected to meet a total jerk, but was surprised calling him a cool guy and somebody you would want to block for. George had also shed 15 pounds in the offseason and shaved his cookie duster, making him look less like an adult film star. In his first season with the Falcons, he achieved a career-high 62% completion rate. A year later, he set a career-high with 4,143 passing yards and might have found a permanent landing spot if he had kept his mouth shut. Seeking to establish roots in Atlanta, the QB had founded the Jeff George Foundation to assist abused and underprivileged children. While head coach June Jones and Falcons Vice President of Player Personnel Ken Harrock envisioned George as the long-term quarterback solution, Falcons President Taylor Smith remained unconvinced. Despite many negotiations, the best offer from the Falcons was a backloaded five-year $25 million contract taken by George as hesitancy. Consequently, Jeff George settled for a one-year, $3.6 million contract in 1996. Despite George still considering Jones a close friend, the reality is that the coach allowed his quarterback's behavior to go unchecked, contributing to George's downfall. Then, the incident happened. These guys are going at it. Yep, Oakland's looking closer for Jeff George. George's public and profanity-laced outburst at Jones after being benched during a nationally televised loss to the Philadelphia Eagles spelled the end for George in hot Atlanta. Jones would say, I would be less than a man if I took what Jeff said to me, and the team knows it. Following the tirade, Jones suspended George the next day, and the Falcons released him in mid-October. George, who was benched against the Eagles after throwing an interception, acknowledges his responsibility for the incident, but adds, I saw the benching as them giving up on the whole season. There was still one man willing to take a chance on the cast-off former number one overall pick, Al Davis, who would have thunk it? And George's arrival in silver and black was magic, a career-high 29 touchdowns, just nine picks, and a league-leading 3,900 yards for the Raiders. The only problem Problem, they only won four games. By 1999, the Raiders had hired a guy named John Gruden, and Georgia's fit into the West Coast offense wasn't exactly seamless. Yes, the first Gruden stint where he had a more secure email server. George willfully ignored play calls from his offensive coordinator, eventually pulled his groin, and announced to a local radio station that he was done for the year. His arch as a fallen journeyman was well underway. George had a successful stint with the Minnesota Vikings in 19. 
1999, leading them to the playoffs with an 8-2 record as a starter, finally dropped in an offense packed with playmakers at his disposal. He posted an elite 8.5 yards per attempt, tossed 23 touchdowns in those 10 starts, and led the Vikings to the only win of his playoff career, toppling the Cowboys by 17 points. So why didn't he stick around in Minnesota? The Vikings were interested in running it back, but they had an ace up their sleeve in rookie quarterback Dante Culpepper, and George eventually became an afterthought to a team that was ready to take the next step with a younger gunslinger. He was actively told by his head coach to shop around, and shop around he did. It never worked in Washington, whether it was with Marty Schottenheimer or North Turner, who didn't even allow George to audible at the line. In seven starts over two years, he won just one game, throwing more picks than touchdowns. His final action in the NFL was a 37 to nothing loss to the Green Bay Packers. After 12 seasons in the league, it was over. Or was it? Five years after taking his last snap at the age of 39 and visibly balding, George was signed by the Raiders in 2006 for a chance to compete for the third string QB job. And then five days later, he was cut. If he couldn't compete in a quarterback room with Andrew Walter, how could he even really make it back. It was really over. Or was it? In 2007, George was insistent that he could make a comeback at age 40 with the Vikings, even going as far as to call Minnesota's play-by-play -play announcer Paul Allen to see if he could gauge whether or not the team had any interest. They did not. A year later, George kept prodding the Vikings and even the Cowboys, insisting he still had his fastball. Unfortunately, that truly was the end for him. He may have seemed a little eager to get back into football, but once he settled into retirement, he's grown up. George returned to his hometown and became a community activist, always willing to help his local church and his local high school. Jeff George was a complicated player. It would be untrue to call him an asshole or a locker room cancer. He was likely more selfish than immature. So maybe the hate was unwarranted. And if you knew the real Jeff George, you wouldn't insult his grandmother or moon him. Until next time. Be anything new, you know. Uh, um, you know they didn't like me when I was here, and they obviously don't like me now. 